Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Sustain Our Software podcast, where we talk about how to sustain our software. Surprisingly, we have two hosts today. I'm Richard Litauer. Hello. And we also have Pia. Hello. And then we also have Robert K. K? 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 K. K. Robert K. And you're calling from Barcelona, right? Correct. Awesome. We've been recording Ruby Rogue since 2011, and we've talked to a lot of people who have had a really deep influence, not only on the programming community, but also on the Ruby community. And as we've talked to these people, it's become apparent to me that we talk a lot about the things that make them interesting that they've done, but we don't really get into how they got into programming or how they came up in their career, how they got to be the person who invented whatever library or or technique that they came on the show to talk about. And so I put together a show where we actually highlight these things. We talk to them about how they got into programming. We talk to them about how they got into Ruby, maybe how they got into Rails. We get a little bit deep into what makes them tick and why they are the way they are. And then we talk about what they're working on. We talk about the things that make them well-known or make them interesting. And a lot of times it's the stuff that goes beyond the code that really makes these people tick and makes them the kind of people that we want to hear about. And so I put together a show called My Ruby Story. You can find it at myrubystory.com. And it's where I interview these people and just get the stories of these people and how they came into programming. So if you want to hear inspirational stories or get ideas on how you can actually advance your career, then go check it out at myrubystory.com. What is it you do? Tell us about yourself and how you got involved with, I believe, Music Brains? Mm-hmm. So I'm officially the boring title is the Executive Director of the Meta Brains Foundation. A more interesting title is the Benevolent Dictator for Life of Music Brains and the other projects and so forth. Just flows a little bit better in a lot of grand scheme of things. We try not to take ourselves very seriously. But uh, the Meta Brains Foundation was originally created to be the legal umbrella for music brains. Now, when we actually created uh, the, the foundation, we knew that we would eventually branch out into other projects. And uh, we've done that. So now we have projects like Listen Brains and Acoustic Brains and Critique Brains and also branching out into a new domain, books. So we have book brains as well. So, you know, a lot of these are sort of, um, are, you know, bifurcating. Our attention is, is being spread a little bit more, but we're accomplishing more things uh, in the grand scheme of things. And I can get more into those particular projects if you want to hear about them. How I got started with this, um, originally it was all started off by me hacking on some MP3 projects back in the day when MP3 was, like most of the world, I hadn't heard about MP3. And uh, the metadata on these files was absolutely terrible. And then Napster came about. And, you know, if you wanted to listen to a music collection, it was just a really crap experience, right? It was just, it really wasn't very good. So the metadata was bad. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another and um, I decided to actually create Music Brain. It took me about four years of working with Music Brain to see where there could actually be a bit of a business model behind it. Once I could recognize what that business model was, then we actually moved to create a uh, nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit in California. Then it took another three years for reasonable amount of money to come in, but uh, I've basically been paid by the foundation since 2007. And now we've actually gotten up to, you know, what is a reasonable salary? Most of my peers that were working in Silicon Valley, Valley and whatnot, earning three times what I'm earning. But um, I think my, my job satisfaction is considerably greater than theirs. So that's one of those factors that, that needs to be taken into account. I got started with all of this very early on because, and this is even before um, the, the GPL was, a, well, not, the GPL wasn't really on people's minds. It had barely been created. But um, this was in the late 80s and early 90s. There was a database called CDDB. And it was um, a database that had um, all the track titles from a bunch of CDs on them because the CDs themselves didn't have the track titles. So you plug a CD in your computer, and then it would just tell you track one, track two, track three, which I thought was boring. Now, these two college kids that came up with a, a concept of having a program that identifies these CDs, and then I started typing in these CDs. That was great. It was the most natural thing to do, right? So I typed these in, and maybe 200 of these, right, because I wanted my, my, my music to show up properly when I was listening to it while I was at work. Well, it worked out okay. And then one day, out of the blue, um, the company I was working for that was different from what I originally started. We'd actually started using the database and we got a, a, a notice from this company and saying like, yeah, we have bought these guys out and you must now display our logo and our jingle. Now, this was back in the day when you know, UIs were not very common, right? So, well, we have a text 
program. Uh, we can't play audio. We can't show an image. And they basically just said, ah, nope, you can't use our database. What? So I was angry at this. I, I felt that this was very much a, you know, private, a public trust sort of violation. And I was fuming about this, fuming about this, fuming. And I was standing with a friend at a party who was actually working at the same company. And um, he said, you know what? I'm just sick and tired of listening to you. Just be about this. Just can you just stop? Like, start an open source project and just leave me alone. He turns here, walks away, and leaves me standing there. It's just like, uh, uh, okay, right. And that was pretty much the thing. That's a good friend. That's a really good friend. <laughs> You know, my friends are just uh, impatient with my constant complaining. So, yeah, right. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm super excited to hear that someone worked on this problem because I spent hours and days and months as a teenager in Winamp editing every single metadata. <laughs> <laughs> That's so painful. So uh, painful. <laughs> it was kind of fun in a neurotic <laughs> way. You know, like I went straight from organizing my National Geographic to organizing <laughs> my, yeah. like, brand new, you know, discography. Yeah, yeah. But now we have tools like Music Brains Picard and where you can download an album and it recognizes the album and you drag it over and you save it. I mean, sometimes they can tag an entire album just because the database is there underpinning all of this in about three seconds, right? That wasn't possible back in the day when we were no. editing with WinApp, right? That was just, no. you know, a, a serious labor of love. You really needed to have one of your metadata to be correct. So what was so, the business model that you hit on? How did, how did that go from... Hey, here's my open source project, and it's 2004 or something. How did they go um, to, I didn't get money for this? The basic um, understanding was that the data was constantly changing. And as more people had access to laptops and cheap recording equipment and so forth, there was a lot more music that was being created. And this data all had to get in the database. And the music industry has never built this database. They've always been forward looking towards the next release, and they didn't really care about their back catalog. That's just not really something that they earn money off, right? They just didn't really care. I recognize that this the, the main factor was churn of data, like getting more data, getting cleaner data, getting better data, also then ideas around context of the data. So where are Facebook feeds, Twitter feeds, where you can download the music, that sort of stuff. Recognize that this churn was effectively going to be the ability for me to actually play a bit of a gatekeeper. And in 2003, we came up with a service that we called the live data feed. And the live data feed, what it does is it allows anyone to actually set up a copy of Music Brain. And then if you turn on the live data feed, then you'll actually get hourly updates. And these hourly updates apply the latest changes that to Music Brain was published and apply them to your own copy, right? So now the database is, you know, we see some somewhere between 200 and 400 people on any random week that are updating their own copies of Music Brains, whether they're big companies, Google, Amazon, BBC, what have you or a whole pile of individuals that uh, are much more insane about the music taking tagging inclinations than we were, right? These people are taking it to way greater extremes than what I'd ever envisioned. So that's pretty good. But the idea there was that there was this recognition that we have this live data feed and the, what we were going to create value around it. I really hate the word monetize. So really not gonna try and use that. Creating value was around a service but we provide a timely and convenient access to the data. Because it's always taken about an hour to import a data snapshot. Data snapshots are Creative Commons zero license, right? So you can just download that. But that just ends up being a pain to do on you know, whatever update frequency you wanted to do, right? So if you're an actual company that wanted to do this and you wanted to provide 24 seven data access availability to your customers, that would be a pain to do. So you go give these metadata hippies a little bit of money, that's us, and uh, the pay for the live data feed. And sure enough, that worked. Now, um, it worked to some degree, right? Because what we had done is we effectively were what I would call licensed purists, right? We were just you know, effectively working on licensing this stuff and really trying to believe in Creative Commons licenses. And we're one of the first people to adopt Creative Commons licenses. And still, we have created, I mean, we're creating a new Creative Commons license document once an hour. And we've been doing that for the last 16 years. So we're kind of prolific Creative Commons publishers in that respect. And it's all, it's not, it's machine curated and so forth, but all the changes are actually made by humans at the end. So we recognized, well, we, this, this system basically worked, but it got us to about a quarter million dollars in annual revenue. And that basically meant we had 
myself and a couple of other people on staff, uh, but we had ambitions to do much, much more. And for a long time, I figured that, well, I tried to actually stab at it and say like, okay, so how can we say a million web service requests are going to cost this much money? Maybe this service costs that, this costs that. And I spent a lot of time trying to make it work, trying to figure out how we could actually make more money than what we've been making up until this point. Right. And I, when I just actually sliced and diced it beyond that, I couldn't even get to the same level of the money that we've been getting from, from customers at that point. So I took in 2015 a bit of a radical step. And I said, okay, we're just going to effectively not really care about licenses anymore. We've never cared about code licenses for code because our code runs music brains. You're not going to take our code and integrate our code into your application. Just no. So that's pointless. Taking our data is kind of useful, but if you don't have updates, then that's not so useful. So, so really, the, the actual value that we have isn't in the data. It's not in the code. It isn't in me. It's actually in the community of people. Right, So it's the people that are editing the database present the actual value of all, all of this. So with this recognition, I just said, screw it. Let's just do away with copyrights. Right? Let's just not even, uh, let's just, it's not even really applicable to us anymore. And what we did, what I did is said, like, okay, we're just changing to a support model. And I basically came up with bronze, silver, gold, and unicorn tiers. So there's 100 bucks, 500,000, and $1,500 a month. The unicorn is for mythical situations and other things, large companies and mythical <laughs> situations, right? I, I kind of thought I was going out on a limb being a bit childish with this, but it turns out that people really kind of embraced it. They're like, oh, yeah, well, we're just a startup, so we want to sign up on bronze, but we hope to become unicorn, sticker, sticker, sticker. So it's just, it's, it's kind of funny, right? The bottom line is that we have a lot of, a lot of startups that are coming in. They either want to do the right thing. They're giving us a hundred bucks a month. Uh, and then we have um, pretty much all of the big companies. So if a big company walks in, it's just like, you guys are unicorn. I don't really care, right? But some of the unicorns also pay twice uh, market rates for because they're sometimes seeing you have special needs or don't want to give attribution and so forth. We'll charge a little extra for that. But so the basic idea then is that people giving us support. And we're not even saying if you use the live data feed or if you use the data snapshots or you use this data or that data. If you gave us commercial support that is on a sliding scale according to what you can pay, so depending on whether it's bronze or unicorn, then you can choose whatever we produce. We don't care how you use it. Just, just use it. Also, the idea is that this is the way if to, if somebody comes in for one of our new projects and wants to use that data in a new project, that that then you know lifts the other projects up as well. So this is sort of opening in the umbrella to, to all of the projects and all the data uh, sets that we have in our database. And this actually worked. This actually worked. So last year, our income actually made it to half a million dollars a year, which is oh, you know great. not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things. But I'm 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 proud of that, right? Yeah. Because now I have a ragtag team of people that are scattered between Chicago and India, and we're all hacking on things. And the one thing I keep harping on is quality of life. And with that, we're hoping that uh, you know if I can make my team happy, and you know nobody's paid competitively, least of all myself. But most everyone, except for myself, is at about 80 to 90 percent of their market value. But the quality of life that my team enjoys is definitely higher than pretty much anybody else that's doing this sort of technical uh, technical job. But this is all on the basis of this the system where we just said, like, we don't really care about copyright anymore. If you use our data, you should support us one way or another. Support us according to your means. And most people just look at this and say, like, yeah, OK, that seems fair. Let's go. Right. And we usually find a way in which to, to find some sort of price point where people say, like, yeah, this makes sense for us. But it's about having a conversation with these people, understanding what their needs are, what their desires are, what they want to do. And then, you know, somehow meeting them in the middle and actually treating any of our, you no, know, we don't actually call them customers, we call them supporters. Right. And the idea is that these people would then actually become more or less our partners that we're working together because when you're dealing with such a database and they have, you know, a few million links to our database, well, it's, they're somewhat dependent on us. So we have to ensure that we're going to be here tomorrow, right? And they understand this. And by giving us a little bit of money, they understand that this allows us to be around tomorrow to continue hacking on these things and to continue improving our services. So interesting. Can you tell me a little bit about Book Brains and what's, you know, what's that, that, what, is, what is it about? And that data said, I'm just a, a bit of a bookworm, so I was, you know, drawn okay. to that in your website. <laughs> okay. 
So book brains is, if you if you understand what music brains is, it is simply music brains applied to a new domain, namely books. There's some overlap because there's audio books and music brains as well. So some of the authors are already in, in that music brains and so forth. The problem in the book space is slightly different. The bottom line is that to see you've got a bunch of book databases as well, but they're all under you know Amazon's control or somebody else's control or a publisher's control and not really freely available for anybody else to use. So, and this is also so that, titles of books and authors and a like year and like the whole metadata about the around the it. book product. Yep, all of it. Now, originally the project was conceived as a community-driven project where we didn't actually give any official support to it. The project really actually took off in, in, in community mindset, sort of like a lot of people really felt like this is the project that they wanted to see. And Summer of Code students came really wanting to work on it, also partially because the project is a little bit more hip as what in JavaScript across. You know, some of the older ones are in, Py in Perl, everything else in between is Python now. So the project is still fairly nascent. And so uh, I you know, doubled down on the project uh, about a year ago. I said, like, look, the, the volunteers that were working on it were not really making enough progress to actually you know, continue keeping the community happy. So I said, okay, we have a little bit of money, and I hired a full-time engineer to work on it. And I tasked him to, within maybe six months, bring it to minimally viable product. A year later, we're still not quite there, but he's making really good <laughs> moves in the, in the right direction. Once we're done with that, we're in talks with Open Library and with other open open data li library projects. Mm. And the general consensus is that Music Brains has demonstrated that we do metadata, the base underlying metadata really well, deal with disambiguation and conflicts and deduplication, those sorts of things. So we're going to take all of our expertise and basically pour it into book brains just the way we do right. typically. And you know, build the base layer of this data so that um, organizations like Internet Archives and Open Library and so forth can build other tools on top, more like the Goodreads, so the recommendation engines that are sitting on top of the, the core of this data. My hope with Music Brains is to eventually go, and I'll talk about this in a little bit if I get an opportunity, but um, we're trying to um, break some of the silos that are out there in the music industry, right? And the book industry really isn't any different. Right? There's just a pile of walled gardens and so forth. Music industry loves their walled gardens. They, you know, data enters Spotify, it never comes back out. Yeah, Spotify is actually better than some of the others, but you know, it's data enters Apple Music and nothing's ever coming back out. Right. So, and these sorts of walled gardens are things that really, really just aggravate me because as, as open source nerds, we, we, we abhor walled gardens, right? We like nice gardens, right? But we like interoperability and those are things that are of great value to us. So these are the things that have been uh, really on my mind. I don't know, did I answer your question sufficiently about the print? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to move on to um, the silos. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so one of the things that, uh, that bugs me about the silos and, you know, this books versus music, we're further along with the book, with, with, the, with the music, because the database is, is mature. Still a lot of things coming in, so the project will never be done, but it's mature compared to the other data sets that we have. But we have been working for the last four years on two new projects that are important to us. Acoustic Brains. And Acoustic Brains is basically the project that uh, does machine learning analysis, machine analysis and then machine learning on top of that analysis to determine what music sounds like, right? So it's the acoustic characteristics. And then trying to derive from that whether it has vocals, whether it's male, female, you know, does it have a guitar, does it have, uh, what genre does it fit into and so forth. There's all kinds of stuff that's going into it. The, the data set is starting to reach maturity. One thing that we're calculating out of that data is beats per minute. And that, that data is, is already interesting in the music brains world. So that's one project. The other project that we built is Listen Brains. And Listen Brains, um, if, do you remember Last FM? Of one course. Of the things that last, oh, good. <laughs> one of the things that Last FM did is allow you to you know, plug your uh, music player in and then support and send the metadata of what you just listened to Last FM. So that builds a, your entire listening history of, of what you can what you just listen to. So we built that with Listen Brains. And you can go back and import your last FM listening history, and I encourage you to do this, since you, you clearly have a last FM listening history. You can import this listening history into, into Listen Brains, and now we will keep it open. You know, we will share it with everyone else, right? But most of the profiles in last FM were public anyway. So people are, are happy with sharing this information and you know, we make it clear that if you use Listen Brains, your data will be public. And if not, you shouldn't 
use risk brands. As long as you're good with that premise, and a lot of people are, then we're going to keep your data um, you know, safe and we're going to keep it up and running. But the beautiful thing about that is that it's the perfect basis for building a collaborative filtering algorithm around people who listen to this might also like that, right? We've been spending pretty much most of the summer building a, you know, Spark cluster and building using the collaborative filtering algorithms in Spark to basically start building the collaborative filtering of this sort of data and generating a data set for that. In parallel, we had another summer of code project that uh, works with acoustic brains to calculate track to track similarities. If I have this track, what other tracks sound similar to this one? So we're building those data sets and we're hopefully going to create a very large virtual machine where you can download all of this. It's going to be a monster download. But if you download this monster uh, virtual machine, then you basically have a sandbox in which anyone can come in and create an open source music recommendation engine. Now, the first music recommendation engines we're going to create are going to be terrible, right? But one difference with this recommendation engine from all of the other ones is that ours is open and it's built on open data and we're going to invite a bunch of people in to come in and play with this because this is latent pent up energy for building a recommendation engine. It's been a really difficult thing to do because you don't have these massive data databases to build these recommendation engines with. Right. And sometimes researchers have been doing these sorts of things and so forth, and they just like pat themselves on the back when they say, like, oh, yeah, we have a really big data set. It's 2,000 tracks. Right. And we're just looking at it like, oh, 2,000 tracks go away. <laughs> right. I mean, if it's not a million tracks, it's not a worthwhile data set. Right? I just I checked like my, my personal profile on Lasset FM. I haven't logged in in years, and apparently I'm still scrabbling. So I have 228,000 listens on it alone. Yes. So that's just mine. <laughs> yeah, please. Please uh, import those into, into <laughs> Listen Brains because that helps us. Right? But we're seeing a, a lot more recommendation engines, right? So Amazon's really keen on this. They've always been big, but also Goodreads recommend stuff. We don't really care about any of those, right? Yeah. Because they're closed. Yeah, they're right? closed. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing that we care about are building open ones. So I've had issues with, with Spotify where it would recommend tracks for me and it was totally not based on my listening history um, my, my listening history at all. So for instance, like every yeah. Sunday morning, it's like, hey, time to go to church playlist. And I haven't been to church since I was 15 when I left in a huff. Yeah. And, so it's like, yeah. and then like everybody got <laughs> recommended Drake when his album came out. I yeah. never listened to Drake, right? So this, you're touching on, on what is you know, my pet peeve in this particular space, that these recommendation engines are entirely biased. Also, we know where the, where the recommendations and the bias is coming from because the people that own Spotify are the record label and yeah. they want to push their content. So it's not, it's not surprising that there's bias. Right? And it's, it's and not the people so, who work on that either. Like one of my good friends is the guy who works on a recommendation engine for Spotify. And yeah. he's a nice guy and he's not trying to do it, but there's top-down level stuff. So it really, it's institutional, systematic. We want people to listen to this, which... That. Is awful, right? I should be able exactly. as a human to listen to what I want. So Exactly. Yeah. Right? And that's all designed not only to feed money back into the existing big labels, but also to keep everyone inside of the, the silo, right? And there's walled garden. So these things all just really aggravate me quite so a lot. How did you what sell I'm, this to funders? How, how did you get people to really like give you money if it's really clear? You, you just don't at all? No, I mean, so if you look at our funders, if you go to metabrains.org slash supporters. I saw so Google. People, so the thing is, these people, you know, are giving us money for music brands. And the things that we're building, nobody else is like, I mean, we've talked to Spotify and Spotify, like we had a good relationship with Spotify as well, right? So not a problem there. And um, by and large, they just don't really feel threatened by us. And also, this is not really very public yet because we're still tinkering on this stuff, right? We're, we're far from done with it yet. But we're just now arrived at the point where the money that's coming in from running music brains, we have a slight bit of excess cash that allows us to actually funnel it towards developing acoustic brains and listen brains. And now listen brains lab, which is the recommendation side of things, right? So it's way early on. And, you know, one of the things that I want to do, and this, you know, finally goes back to, to sustaining open source and sustaining ourselves in this particular case, is that by building a recommendation engine and ultimately have this perhaps Quixote an idea that um, a Quixote idea that what we want to do is if there's a music label, small medium music label that comes in and they have one computer geek on staff, right? Dedicated computer geek, and their job is to make things better. 
what they can do and what I want them to do is to be able to say, all right, we're going to go feed all of Music Brains data, all of our data from our label into Music Brains. And then what we're going to do is we're going to download a specially trained music recommendation engine for our label and then allow people to say, okay, I let you listen to this music. Maybe they point them to the Spotify uh, profile or to the Listen Brains profile, whatever to solve the cold start problem you know, for the recommendation. And then to actually start rec recommending content of that particular label. So I envision something where you know people arrive at a label's webpage, then say, oh yeah, make me a customized playlist that's good for me. You get the customized playlist made, and now you listen to the content that that label has recommended for you because they know about you, they know about your your listening proclivities, and now the data is there to do this, right? And you know my hope is that you know these labels, none of them are really gonna pay, would pay us more like hundred bucks a month, but still. You know, if we have, and there's a pile of labels out there that do this sorts of thing. And if they could get a recommendation engine for 100 bucks a month, they'd be tickled pink. So, and, you know, if, they're, if their geeks are doing the work to, to bring these systems uh, online and so forth, that should be a win-win all around. So that's kind of where I'm thinking. That's awesome. Back when functional programming was making its resurgence, I found it really interesting that a lot of people were moving over there and it almost felt like it was on hype. And I didn't really understand the power of functional programming until I learned Elixir. Elixir is a functional programming language. It's built on the Erlang virtual machine, and it really does some interesting things and makes you build apps in a different way. But what's really fascinating about it is the speed of the applications, the ability to distribute work easily, and just how it manages the functional programming and all of the nice things about it so that you don't have to worry about side effects and a lot of the other things that come out of functional programming. Plus, pattern matching in Elixir is a killer feature. If you're looking for a new language that you want to learn that is going to make a difference for you and give you the opportunity to challenge some of your thinking and find a new way of doing it, Elixir is a great way to go. And we have a podcast now on Elixir called Elixir Mix. And you can find that at elixirmix.com. It's also really close to home for me. I actually had a website for a while, losslesslabels.com, where I was trying to make a list of all the labels that provide lossless music. Because I really wanted lossy stuff. And I guess think of crappy MP3s yeah. back when in the Napster days. I want to move back a bit to sustaining. So one of the things you talked okay. about was quality of life for your developers. Mm -hmm. How do you reconcile having quality of life for your developers and letting them have, you know, maybe their Fridays off or letting them go for walks? I don't know, whatever you do to make their lives great versus this desire to get all this stuff out the door and to build music brands into a great thing, which is probably there. I, I, I see some ambition, not negative ambition, but you, you have goals. So how, how do you reconcile those two things? You know what? It's, I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about that. It's just a very basic <laughs> idea that if you trust your team and you, uh, I don't want to use the word empower either, right? But like yep. my team, my team has, has the ability to carry out whatever they need to do to, to do their job. I basically only get in the way when it has to do with legal and money. So those are the two things. My team knows like, okay, it's a legal question or it's a money question. We need to go back to Rob and ask him. Everything else, and the teams are self-empowered to, to do as they need to do. And we don't have a lot of pressures from outside world. So we don't have a lot of uh, deadlines. We have two, up to two self-imposed deadlines unless we don't feel like doing a deadline, which is kind of nice. Right. But the, the bottom line is that, so for instance, the only deadlines that we do have are if we do a schema change. And schema change means that the replication has to stop because the downstream users all have to update their, their service according yep. to the new machine. So now you find yourself in a position where you have to be in lockstep with Google and Ticketmaster and Spotify and Last.fm and all these other companies. That's a bit of a challenge. So what we do is we say 60 days in advance of the date when we do the schema change, we tell people, hey, these are the things changing here. The tickets follow along, ask us questions, what have you. Most of the time, the customers are not really affected by this, but they just have to be aware that it's coming. They have to have an engineer on point that day that they can you know, fix the server, roll out the new software, and make sure it keeps running. Not a big deal. If you've got two months' time, no big deal to do that sort of stuff. And that's, and that's the basic idea behind this. That's where we need a, a deadline for. And then sometimes the team is busy and says, yeah, we're not going to do dead, deadline this year. And they just keep working on their own, uh, own setup. And part of them is that if we're working on, on a new feature, and we determine and we do releases every two weeks, right? And if a, uh, if a feature isn't ready, then you know, our community makes it very clear. It's like, hey, look, we really don't want to work with broken features. Like, we'd be, we're just happy to sit out another release cycle for this feature. We just want it to work. What a great luxury we have. And 
you know, more or not more, like more or less, I consider that to be part of quality of life. If you don't have deadlines and they feel like, hey, there's a concert, I want to go see the concert. The rule, the rule of thumb is go see the concert, work and wait. So that's, that's where quality of life also comes in. I have a question there. There's like one thing that I found in Open Collective that is very helpful is I also hate the word empower. So what we, but, but essentially it's like we try to provide a framework for the team to kind of organize themselves towards that, right? That we collect the Open Collective way. And it's just how we operate in the world and what the general expectation is. And it's basically, we trust by default. Don't lie. If you can't make it, it's fine. If you're not at work, it's because you're doing something else and you'll catch up later. But it's like that kind of philosophy. So I was just wondering if you have some tips or some kind of framework that worked for you. I saw on your website that you have transparent um, finances. So I was just wondering if you also have transparency on these kind of other processes or communication protocols or ways that you kind of generally operate with your team that might be helpful for other communities like this? Hmm. So we, we have the luxury of having started from scratch in this organization. And one of the, one of the things we said, instead of, instead of asking ourselves, can this be open? We ask ourselves, must this be closed? Right. Which is just, is a completely, it's a game changer, complete game changer. So, so if you have to ask yourself what needs to be closed, that tends to be board discussions about future partners and potential employee conflicts and employee compensation. I'd like to really kind of fix the employee compensation and have that be open as well. But, oh, boy, what a can of worms, especially when you have people that are sitting in Chicago and in Bangalore. So the earning tip- potential is just so different. Yeah, so so just a little Sorry. point there before you continue. Like, so what we did at Open Collective to do that is we have like just levels, so we don't have like conversation. You you know, you have like basic level, mid level, top level, and then everyone kind of expects that, and everyone is like on one of those three tiers, and then that's pretty much it, right? So we kind of we removed a lot of the friction, but just having three options. And we're a small team, so it works. Mm. But yeah, so if you have a larger team, you might have more options, but then just having a set of options and that's where you kind of fit in, then that's it, right? That reduces the conflict of right. fr- fr- uh, and the friction a lot. And then the company <laughs> Buffer, um, Buffer has an open um, compensation policy and they have these, they already figure it out. They've been doing this for years. And so we might use uh, this from them, but essentially like an algorithm to compensate for cities. I'm generally of the kind of philosophy that it doesn't matter where you are, like you, you, you're going to get into these like three presets. But afterwards, like when we, as we scale the team, there, there's an obvious difference between like the purchase, you know, capacity of someone earning the same salary in like one city or the other one. So Buffer, you created this algorithm to compensate for that. So if you're ever interested, that's, a good place to look. I, I may very well touch base with you on that. that. That is interesting. We're also getting up to speed on doing things like um, contract reviews and so forth and trying to be a little bit more professional without getting bogged down in the nonsense of that that usually comes with that. So, but yeah, I may very well uh, you know, come back to you on that one. That's, that's interesting to hear. Let's see, where was I? Quality of life and the things that you Quality are, life. things that are closed, oh, yeah. that must be closed and things that are yeah. then generally open. So, so quality of life really comes down to just having enough trust for your team to do, your, to do their job, right? And also, I, I very rarely will step in and say, you must now do this. I, my team should self-organize and say, like, well, we work for the community. The community is our boss. And every once in a while, if the customer comes in with special needs or, you know, so, sorry, a supporter comes in with special needs, then I might, might say, like, hey, team, I need you guys to, you know, do this, blah, 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 blah. Right? But I do that very sparingly to the point where when I do need to step in and say, hey, team, I need this done in a short order of time, my, my team is actually ready to do that because they know that this is a serious thing and I reserve that sort of request for serious things, which is quite nice. But the rest of the time, it's pretty much as you said, my team makes their own schedule, and which can be kind of difficult sometimes. Like just the other day, um, one of our team members needed to have a meeting. I said, okay, are you guys here? And everyone responded, yeah, I'm here-ish on mobile, but I can follow along, right? But I'm on bus or I'm at a barbecue, whatever. So, you know, this, that brings about this sort of strange, we're like, oh, wait a minute, I'm not really disconnecting from work, 
but at the same time, you want to be there for your teammates. So it's, you know, while a lot of us don't really connect, disconnect from work a lot, we do have such a high quality of life that the not being able to disconnect isn't that big of a deal. So, you know, for instance, I'm pretty much always on. I travel a lot, partially because I can. So I'll just disappear and, you know, spend two weeks in Taipei because I've never been to Taiwan. But I'm working from there. So, you know, I'm running around, I'm enjoying all the dumplings, this, that, and the other thing and so forth, but I'm still working. And, but really only about two weeks out of the year is when I'm actually trying to be gone. And that means like I'm only working half hours per day, right? So, but that's just sort of, that's just sort of one of those, one of those things about running an open source organization. It's like, you know, unfortunately I can't replace myself. I've been trying for a really long time, but. I don't know if it's a certain level of idiocy that that is present in me to continue doing this, but I can't find somebody else that's willing to do it. So, but then you know, like I personally don't have a problem with with not being able to disconnect completely from work because my quality of life is high enough that I don't I don't hold a grudge being able to not to disconnect because my coworkers are my friends, right? And when something really goes wrong, then I'm going to step in and so forth because. Well, maybe my system administrator's enjoying his quality of life, and I happen to be at the computer, and, well, okay, I better go fix it now. It's a lot about give and take, but I think it's the, the, the basic idea is that you need to start with trust. If you don't have any trust and, you know, you're second-guessing what your team is doing, then you're never going to build a community that's, that's going to self-start and do amazing things. Not sure if it's sufficiently answered the question. There are no answers. There's only uh, no discussion. Okay. There's no, there's, yeah. <laughs> there's, but, uh, there's it's, only it's really interesting. Uh, there's been a lot of similarities between the other guests of this podcast um, and just also the prominent voices in this field where pretty much every open source organization I've talked to is also remote first, which they just seem to go hand in hand, right? It seems to be yep. like, well, we're open source. Why not open life as well in some sort of sense? Yep. Right? Well, because open source came out of being remote. Yep. Money and and companies came into it much later, so it's just a natural way of doing. And you know, if somebody is a naysayer, says, "Oh, that'll never work." It's like, well, you know, right? the Linux it works. For us, just isn't, isn't a question, but it's just if you come with this idea that you don't trust your employees and you need to like check up on them every five minutes, yeah, you're in the wrong field, completely. Absolutely, absolutely. Robert, where do you want to take um, music brains or meta brains, like the kind of umbrella organization? Like, what's your, you know, in your in your wildest dreams? Like, what you know, what do you want to create? Well, I would like to create more tools that improve the music listening experience, so the recommendation engines and so forth. But there's a bit of a hidden agenda behind this as well, and this hidden agenda is that. My primary partner, she's um, a British woman who is pretty much an entertainer. She plays violin, she sings, and you know she's also an educator for teaching English. The primary amount of income comes from teaching English. And the money she makes from being a musician is unfortunately just a pit. How many of you have got friends that are in bands that are playing for beer money with no hopes of ever making any money? I have plenty of those people. Well, I, I'm really angry with the fact that, okay, I'm a geek. Right? I know how to use my brain, and that means that I get to pay, I get paid a decent amount of money, and I can choose the city in, in which I want to live. And I live right in the heart of Barcelona, and I feel like I'm a gentrifying force, and I hate that. I'm trying to give back as much as possible and so forth. But it's just the bottom line. It's like, you know, it's like, look, I'm a big white male, and bestowed with a huge amount of privilege, and, and you know, that bugs me at the end of the day. So what I, what I really want to do is I want to go and support musicians. Right. I, I really want to go out there and um, because what, what's happening right now, if you look at the recommendation engines inside of the silo, they're recommending the big label content, content and the small band cannot be heard. All that data is there, right? You could listen to them if you could find them, but you don't know what to search for. It's not being surfaced. We know that most of the tracks in, in Spotify have never been played or been played less than 10 times. Some ridiculous number. Well, that's not really helping. So if, if we can actually build a system where we can listen to more small record label content and spread the 10 bucks a month that many of us are spending in much further, much far, far flung places. And ultimately what I'd love to see is that musicians that have perseverance, um, maybe a slight bit of a pension for business and, and marketing themselves, they should really be able to actually have a um, middle, middle, uh, middle class living. Right, and not just 
say like, well, I'm a musician, but I uh, work at a call center too. That needs to stop, right? So we need to be able to, to elevate the artists in the world to be able to actually also earn a living as well. So that's, that's kind of the goal. And um, to that effect, I've also written the white paper that kind of talks about how we can take some of the open source community ideas and actually apply them in the music industry. So we guys in the music and in, in the, in the open source industry, we've created an entire industry that's got a whole pile of roles in it. Most of them are unpaid, but a whole pile of roles. You've got software maintainers for distributions. You've got people that write documentation, people that do nothing but uh, lord over bug trackers, right? Like there's all kinds of different roles that have been taken in this. In the music industry, everyone is just sort of standing out there with their hand. Give me money, I'll do something for you. It's not being put on in his head where it's like, hey, let's let's all collectively work harder and collectively see if we can show up, share tips, share studio space, share resources to make music, and then then cross promote and these sorts of things are just pretty much not really happening. They're happening, they're happening on a very minuscule scale. But open source knows how to do that. We know how to get the right software in the right people's hands, how to elevate people's attention, how to call attention for these things, how to get bugs fixed. We know these things. So why not take these sorts of concepts and actually apply them to the music industry? I, I think it's possible. So, but one of the critical elements that is a, a five-year project is to build the recommendation engines that are part of this, right? Because now there's so much music out there that humans can't do it alone anymore. So we need to actually have curating humans and machines working side by side to actually see if we can find out what the good stuff is. And then we also need to find other volunteers, big dev types, and you know this is this is where I'm really talking unicorns because these dev types are not open source types, are not not the types to really jump in to do help out with open source projects. But you know still we need to find a way in which we can actually take some of these artists and actually give them a little bit of attention and a little bit of help to take their craft and build it into something that can sustain them. It's just a different form of of focus on sustainability. And again, the, the focus that we have right now on sustaining open source. I think could actually play in five years time into how sustaining the music industry because they're not dissimilar and in, in like, you know, we're talking about passionate, creative people. We're technically creative and they're musically creative, but, you know, by and large, we share a lot of common values. And so, so, so what I like to do with music brands and to build more data sets, recommendation engines, connect more humans, and ultimately raise a middle class of musicians. Lofty goals. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> Ambition. <laughs> cool. I think that's a great place to end this. I think Pia probably. Yes. Uh, that's an awesome, <laughs> awesome sentiment. It's been so good hearing you. I feel like I've just been listening in awe at how coherent and beautiful you are. <laughs> Thank um, you. Um, I talk about this a lot. So, I can yeah, tell. Talking, yeah, it's like, great. Got these, right? <laughs> you're but good it, at it. Like you're it comes at. across good. like your passion and the, it's, it really yep. comes across, which is great. Everyone who can't see, he's been asleep this entire time and his yeah. mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and next thing to tell people I have a normal haircut too. Yeah. <laughs> very, very normal. I didn't want to bring it up. Very I normal. <laughs> One of my favorite communities to get involved with these days is the Angular community. There are so many great people there. We've had a lot of them on Adventures in Angular over the last several years. And I really wanted to just highlight people and give you a chance to get to know the flavor and the feel of being around some of these awesome people. We've talked to people on the Angular core team. We've talked to people who have organized the conferences. We've talked to some of the co-hosts that I've had on Adventures in Angular Nowadays, Aaron Frost is running the show and he's doing the same thing. Typically, he's been doing it at conferences lately, which is a lot of fun. But you get to hear what these people are about and why they care and how they get involved with other people in the Angular community. So if you're looking for that connection in the Angular community and a way to really understand the people who are involved in the Angular community, then go check out My Angular Story. You can find it at myangularstory.com. All right, so this is the part of the podcast where we do picks. It's the end. It's tradition to have the guests go last. So we'll go first. And it's like two or three things, which we think is interesting, which we should all, you know, look at. I'm going to suggest Brigitte Chamboil. I don't know how to pronounce this because it's Gallic. B-R-I-G-H-D-E and then C-H-A-I-M-B-E-U-L. Some of the best piping music I've heard in a long time. I was driving across Iceland with a friend of mine who's a big piper. I used to live in Scotland. I mean, bagpipes. And uh, Brigitte is one of the lesser known artists on Spotify. Uh, I think less than her biggest track is less than 15,000 listens. Highly, highly recommended. Just amazing. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, and the next one is 11,000. The last, the 10th is 5,000. It's really sad. Yeah. At least five, 10 of those are already me. And I only started listening to her like this week. <laughs> so that's break this Sean Boyle is freaking awesome. Uh, second recommendation is going to be, I haven't read a book recently. Oh no. Pia, what are your picks? Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to start with a book, just, uh, just you know, because. So I am reading A Snow Crash, which I have oh, read now. That is so freaking good. Um, it's giving me a hard time to fall asleep at night. I, I have a, the habit of reading every night in, in bed since, I don't know, I learned how to. Yes, this is, um, I'm very tired in the mornings. <laughs> but I, um, if you haven't read Snow Crash, I absolutely, it's amazing how for a book that is like focused on hackers and technology and it's been written in the 90s, how absolutely timeless it is. It's it's crazy. Like just and a it's by here Neil Stevenson, there. right? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Neil Stevenson. Stevenson. Yeah. So anyway, that's my book recommendation. And then I have a Toy Store recommendation today, which is Juguetronica in Madrid. Is this amazing robot an electronics toy store. I took Roma the other day and she loved it. Um, in the basement, there's like a robot museum. They have like this really cool collection of robots and there's like a, you know, 45 minute kind of talk um, around it. It was great. Roma is my uh, four-year-old. So she loved it. We got back home with like a set of Mecanos and a robot dog that I, yeah, I'm regretting. But anyway, um, and then the... <laughs> The last recommendation is the Science and Technology Museum in Madrid. If you're here, it's free and it's awesome. Like take your kid or go yourself by yourself. Cool. It is really, really good. It's air conditioned. Uh, so it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> and I highly recommend it. It's, it's really, really cool. Science and Technology Museum. Um, go that, that. that is awesome. I think my partner's uh, nine-year-old son would really appreciate the, uh, the robot museum. Uh, it's great. You, you, definitely, yeah. Roma was playing around with an R2-D2 and like, you know, it's, it's also very Star Wars. Um, so it's great, yeah. All right. So my recommendations, I've recently re-fallen in love with an album by Peter Gabriel called Passion. It is the soundtrack to The Last Temptation of Christ. You know, it's not necessarily my favorite movie, but uh, the music itself is just really on point and fantastic programming music for just put it on and I just float through my dance. It's really lovely. Quite good. The counter tip to that one is that there's also an album and it's become more difficult to find called Passion Sources. And it lists all the music that Peter Gabriel used as inspiration for this particular album. So really quite interesting. And then to riff off what Pia was saying, I recommend the Spanish TV show Casa de Papel. Because I'm currently using that as um, I, I, it's on Netflix, so I'm watching that to to learn Spanish with my comprehension. Listening to Spanish has been really still pretty poor because like everybody in Barcelona see me coming and they just want to speak English to me, right? But it makes it difficult to learn Spanish, especially in a yep. Catalan. Yeah, right? I was gonna so, say <laughs> it's a tricky proposition. Yeah. <laughs> it is, and it's taken me far longer, and I'm very very embarrassed by this. But I have to say, Casa de Papel. The thing that's beautiful about it is in Spanish, it is, you know, the, all the Spanish swearing and everything. And it's the, the colloquialisms that I, that I direly need. They're, and, you know, it's also good that it's not Barcelona, the fact that it's Madrid. So, and that's the reason why I'm a little bleary eyed in the morning because I'm spending my evenings watching Cut Yeah, it has great reviews. I, have, I haven't seen it yet, but everyone raves it's, about it. it is, <laughs> you know, the, the writing is good and the characters are well developed and it's, it's, it's quite good. I don't know if uh, there's even any version of it available in English. So no that idea. might not be much help to you, but, uh, uh, you know, for us. So. It's probably subtitled, though, in Netflix. Uh, I don't even think it has English subtitles. No, really? That surprised yeah, me. Just Spanish. And, and, uh, but the, the good thing is that the, the, the subtitles actually match the words because you can go and, um, you know, watch a whole bunch of other things with Spanish audio and subtitles. But since they're being done by separate contractors and your contractors only being in snippets at a time, they hardly ever match up, which is terrible for learning idioms and learning to understand the whole language. <laughs> ah, it's a, it's a godsend for me. That's a, a project for your next for your next um, <laughs> organization. <laughs> no, no. no I have it's two, a pretty I cool have project. project. Yeah. yeah all right. Well, I wanted to thank you for the uh, opportunity to run my yeah. mouth at length. 
I'm always interested in talking about sustaining open source because it seems to be a very pressing topic and getting more pressing by the day. And uh, in general, we need to, we need to, I really like in the post capitalistic society, we need to figure out how to actually go from competition to cooperation and sustaining yeah. cooperation is. I think uh, you folks are actually, you know, a little bit earlier than the mass wave. Like, we need to think about this more. So the more conversations we can have around this, more people talking about this, because I'm absolutely sick and tired of this capitalistic world where I'm actually in the process of trying to start another open source project nonprofit. And at this time, actually I'm on a sex education bed and 3D printing. Don't ask. <laughs> and just trying to create a nonprofit is horrendously difficult because nobody will give you a bank account because of all the money laundering. But that's what Open Collective does. So we have a foundation that would absolutely be able to help you out in the US. Absolutely. So let's chat off of this. <laughs> yeah. Robert, if someone wants to chat yeah. with you about anything you brought up, <laughs> but it's uh, where can they find you? Where can people find you to continue these conversations? Where are you on the web? Do you have a Twitter? Do you have a GitHub? What do you have? It's at Mayhem BCN, so Mayhem Barcelona on Twitter. You can also find me, Rob, at metabrains.org. Yeah, those, those are probably the two best places to, to grab me. All right. Thank you so much. All right. All right. Um, Great. Thanks. Have a good day. And um, I think I'll drop you uh, an email, Pia, about this. Uh, let's see if there's something that can be done about this. It's yeah, I, I, I would absolutely be delighted to help. Just let, okay. let me know. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com to learn more.